Okay, this is the uh, punk and roll day in Montague with the sun coming up very nicely. A little chilly this morning, about uh, th uh, 32, 34 degrees when we got up, but we're on our way. Registration is taking place, uh, and you know, it's uh, easily done. You, for a dollar, you can register, and if you need a pumpkin, you can pay another dollar, and you can get a pumpkin at the time you register. What's going to happen today, of course, is we have the bake sale uh, of uh, pies and baked goods at the Senior Center. All of the merchants have special events going on in their various uh, places. Uh, Lipka's has ice cream, including pumpkin ice cream. The uh, Book Nook has hot chocolate and coffee and offers uh, hot chocolate, free hot chocolate to all the Blue Ribbon winners. The uh, Wanda's Pets has a, you know, a, a program going on and having a, a pet judging contest. And of course, Todd's or Hometown Pharmacy has specials going on there. There's also, uh, the, as I said, the bake sale at the uh, Senior Center and a pumpkin pie contest there that takes place about uh, 11 o'clock, I believe. The biggest pumpkin, hopefully, we'll have some big pumpkins. One has been brought in already in front of Lipka's. Looks pretty good. That'll be judged about 11 o'clock. And we have face painting at the Nuveen Center. Painting of pumpkins in front of Todd's Pharmacy, and the pumpkins hand-painted are there. There's a steam engine at the end of Ferry Street, which is going to be operating a cider mill and making free cider. So you go up and watch the steam steam engine operating. There are going to be hay rides behind the senior center with a hay wagon uh, and a draft, I think either draft horses or a tractor, we're not sure which, uh, by J&J &J Resort. And then of course if you've got a par carved pumpkin we want it in front of the Greenwich Realty for judging there. So that's the way it is and then at the end of the pumpkin rolling there's going to be Art in the Road and Dancing in the Street by uh, Nuveen Art Center, and that's right there on Ferry Street. We'll start rolling pumpkins about uh, 11 o'clock and hopefully be done around uh, 1 o'clock maybe. So everybody should have a lot of fun. There's pumpkins. Farmer's Market is open. You can buy all kinds of goodies down at the Farmer's Market, fresh vegetables, fruits, and more pumpkins. And, of course, Shoal Farms have a wagon up here on Main Street. We hope you have a good time. Also, we have a new song that was written by a local, a local artist here in the, well, the White Lake area. Wrote a song called Going to the, or, um, Going to the, Onto the Pumpkin Roll, and it was written uh, by Eric Wentland, who has donated and dedicated to, to the children of all ages. So listen for the song. It's a great, fun song. Have a good time here at the Punk and Roll. And if you're watching this tape, you better be here next time. How many, how many years has this been going on? This is our 13th year. 13th year. Yep. With Gl yep. Glenn Lipka and I uh, sat around a cup of coffee one day and talked about when we used to, as I was police chief, have to chase the kids who were rolling pumpkins down the hill and they'd end up in his front yard store uh, entryway all smashed and that and I said you know what we should do we should give it close it down and give every kid a chance to roll a pumpkin down the hill and he said that's a good idea and from that point we started and got a committee together and now it's grown to last year 940 Two, I think it was, pumpkins were rolled down the hill. With my brother's great-grandchildren, we've been in this area for seven generations now because our great-grandparents came here in 1899 and built a home on Hancock in Montague Township. And uh, my grandfather married my grandmother, who was a daughter to uh, Henry and Margaret Sieben, and built a house, a log house, on that same piece of property. How many of you know the what I still call the uh, Harry Block log house on Hancock? 
there's a log house on Hancock. Well, right across the street was the original Seaman farm, my grandmother's father's farm. And they had, Grandma and Grandpa built a log house just like Block's house. But it caught fire in 1910 and burned to the ground, taking the barn and the chicken house and everything with it. So Grandpa decided there wasn't any place to make enough money to build again here, so he moved to Chicago, took his uh, kids, my father and his two sisters. Dad had gone to school at the school on Post and Hancock, where they sell um, asparagus. Now he's got a little, that house on the northeast corner was the school that my dad went to when they were on the farm. Anyway, make a long story short, uh, Grandma and Grandpa came back <clears throat> uh, to the farm after Grandpa made enough money to get uh, going again. And uh, then my dad was in a severe accident in Chicago uh, and, and uh, couldn't work anymore and decided that we were going to move back to the farm. So we moved back to the farm in 1942. But it was like being at home because I had spent every Christmas, every Christmas, every summer that I can remember. Um, and I have pictures showing me even before I can remember on the farm with uh, the great grandmothers at, and staying at their house. So I was in Michigan all summer in the, from my childhood until we moved back. And so it, was, it always seemed like that was more of a home than Chicago was. But you can imagine my dad married a girl who was from Chicago. And although mother had been up in the summertime with great grandma and grandpa, she knew what the rigors of country living were. But if you can imagine that when my dad could no longer operate, uh, he had a severe skull fracture and uh, was incapacitated for several years, to move from Chicago where she had running water, central heat, transportation, electricity, to a three-room home that my dad and I built, 24 by 24, with a coal stove in the one room, and there was a small bedroom for my one brother, uh, Don, who was, Wayne was born when we were here, and a larger bedroom for my folks, and then one big room, which was the living room, the dining room, the kitchen, and whatever else. But mother made it. She adjusted the, we had a, we had a three-holer and, and we had carpeting on it, <laughs> carpeting. And my grandmother's was even greater than that because she had wallpaper in hers. <laughs> I'll have to tell you, maybe I should, well I will. Grandpa used to drop a piece of newspaper in the hole before he sat down in the winter time kind of warmed it up a little bit. So I thought I would do that. Well, if you don't get that paper down far enough, when it flares up, it not only warms you, but it gets you off the hole, I can tell you. Well. <laughs> but we didn't get electricity. In fact, we didn't get electricity in uh, 1952 and we my folks uh, bought the Rose Farm which is on the corner of Hancock and Lehman um, not Lehman uh, Lamus and uh, that's where they moved to while I was in the service overseas and uh, the REA came and they said we're putting lines in, but it'll cost you $100 for the pole to get it to your farm. And my dad says, no, I ain't paying $100. Well, my mother and dad got into quite a discussion about that. But dad held fast until the farm next to us, or down on south of us, um, Napier, Mr. Harry Napier came up and he said to my dad, he says, Hank, 
we decided we want electricity, but I understand you won't pay for the pole on yours. And he says, uh, well, it's $100, my dad said, and I ain't paying $100. He says, we're getting along all right. Well, Harry says, I'll tell you what, he says, if, would you have him put the pole in for $50? And my dad says, well, yeah, I, I expect maybe we'd do that, but they aren't going to cut down on it. And Harry says, that's all right. He says, I'll give you the other 50, because my wife says, we're going to have it. <laughs> And so they, they did, and then they got the electricity, but my mother told my dad, why didn't you hold out? He'd have probably given you the other fifty, <laughs> and you wouldn't have to pay anything. Well, so after that, she was much happier with everything. Um, I can tell you all kinds of stories about G's, but let me, let me just reminisce a little bit about what I can remember about G's. One other thing about Carl, he was a great guy. And he could add up the stuff as it was being laid out on the table in his head faster than either I or ever could add it up on the adding machine. As it was laid out on there, he just came up with it. It, was just, it just amazed me how quick he was in, in doing that sort of thing. Great guy to work for. Uh, and as you all know, I ended up with a licensed funeral director primarily because of Carl, because he helped me with my schooling, paying for my schooling. The only thing I argued about him was when I was making 32 cents an hour. He uh, pulled me aside and said, now, he says, you're not going to get your full check. Uh, what do you mean I'm not going to get my full check? It's only a couple of dollars or so. He said, no, he says, I'm holding out 10% and I'm investing it for you. Well, you know, when you're, when you're 17 or 18 years old, you don't, well, 16 years old, really, and, and after that. And he said, no, nope, I'm putting that into Investors Diversified, and that's going to be yours, and it'll grow rapidly, and you'll be happy to do it. Well, I never was until um, when I came back from the service, I needed some money. And by golly, there it was, and it was all because of Carl. And he, he didn't talk to me about it, he just told me he's going to do it, you know. <laughs> well, you've heard where all the places were. Uh, one of them that uh, I used to work at the A&P. Remember the A&P store was? Bud Kunis was the manager at that time. And Mary Morningstar was the cashier. And I was the stock boy and, and uh, the... Um, vegetable, uh, what it, green goods, uh, take care of, yeah, produce, and we had a little misty thing that was over the counter, and you had to make sure that was clean, so the mist was nice, and kept the vegetables all nice. But Bud, Bud Kunis and Mary were, what do I want to say, adversarial from the beginning when I worked there. And I, I probably shouldn't say this, but Mary could cuss more than any mule skinner. And Bud Kunis was her equal. And when they got in it on to something, the ears of a young boy got very red because they didn't pull any punches. But they were very good when customers were in the store. So, you know, nobody else knew it except when I was over at the counter and doing what I had to do, and I'd hear those two up in the front going at it. Oh, man, oh, man, I've never heard anybody talk like that before. Well, but then I used to take my lunch at uh, Lil Ransom's. You remember Lil had a little restaurant there, and uh, I guess it's where uh, Pitkins got their store, new store now, right? That was, a, wasn't that Lil's? Yeah. yeah. And uh, that was a great place to go. But of course, working at G's, the other place I went was Dowker's. And uh, most of you know that uh, we Montague boys kind of had a thing about Whitehall girls, you know, that was kind of a, not supposed to cross the bridge, you know, all that kind of stuff back then, anyway. Um, but I used to get one heaping big malted when I went in there from a certain gal behind the counter. And one day she threw the counter wiping rag at me, and it hit me, and I thought, doggone, somebody's got to tame that gal. And so I did, and I finally asked her to marry me. She said yes, and we, we've gone from there. 
In Montague, what I remember fondly is old uh, Fred Sweet's general store. Anybody remember Fred Sweet in the general store? There's somebody way in the back. Fred's general store was a general store. I mean, it had everything from clothing to uh, food to meat to uh, lamps to fuel oil. My brother Wayne was uh, about five, six years old, I think, and winter was coming. He didn't have any long underwear. So Friday nights was a big night in Montague. Friday night, the family went downtown. Mother went shopping over to Sweets. Dad went over to Happy Crawls for his beer. And us kids all went down to Olson's Barber Shop because the Chamber of Commerce had free movies on the side of the building. Okay. Great night. I mean, well, it was just great. Well, we went, Mother and, and Wayne and I were down there, and we went into Sweets because we always had to get some candy to take over to the, see the show. And she asked uh, Sweet if he had any underwear left for little kid or small kids. Oh yeah, he says, I, hey, I'm sure I got some up there. He says, it's getting toward winter. So he got up on the ladder and the top shelf and pulled down a box and by golly, there was a set of long johns, wool. Ma says, I'll take them, they'll fit, that's the right size. Well, we got home and she says, now I want you to try these on. Well, Wayne pulled them on and they had feet in them. <laughs> he said, I ain't wearing these to school, I'm not wearing anything with feet in them. I said, but, it's just, no, no, you know, you had the trap door in them, and there's said, no, he wasn't going to wear them. He finally talked Grandma into cutting the feet out and hemming them, but he wore them and then itched all winter long, as we all did in those kind of darn things. Uh, Fred's uh, son was our uh, mailman, or, I'm sorry, Fred was the mailman, Bill was, Bill Sweet was the father, Bill was at the, at the grocery store, Fred was the mailman. Fred used to get to our house, out to the farm, out to our place in the winter time, and he'd toot the horn two times, Dad would go out and open the barn door, and Fred would pull in and put the chains on his car, because we had a hoist in the barn, and he could hook the cup lift back into his car up and put the chains on to do the rest of his route up into Oceana County. And just as uh, regular as clockwork almost. And I asked him once, I said, why don't you do that downtown before you ever start out? He says, no place to lift it. <laughs> so those were the kinds of things. Well, Roger put down here some things. Let me see. One of them is uh, what significant childhood events well, as I said, you know, I spent every summer as long back as I can remember uh, hunting and fishing and riding horses and swimming and just doing all the kinds of things that kids did at that time. When I was 14, my grandpa decided it was time for me to learn how to plow, and of course, we were still, he was still using horse. And if any of you have ever tried to handle a single blade plow behind a Belgian horse, which takes force to get the, the shoe into the ground. And at 14, I probably weighed 90 pounds, maybe 80 pounds. I was a skinny kid. And I could not keep that damn plow in the ground. The grandpa says, you just aim for that. See that tree down there? Yeah. You just go right for that, and you'll plow a beautiful straight furrow. Well, I started out, I, I plowed a furrow all right. Half of it was a furrow, half of it wasn't a furrow, half of it was on the ground, half of it was stuck into the ground, the horse couldn't even move it. But I learned how to plow. Uh, it, it took me some time to do it, but at that time there was, we didn't have tractor. Grandpa wouldn't buy a tractor even when they were available. And uh, so, family's role in the community, well, as you all know, uh, Starting with my father, he was a deputy, special deputy sheriff, and ran the uh, the um, 
system for both fire and police in Montague and my brothers and nephews and nieces and sons and everybody been involved. Favorite place in the White Lake area? Um, I guess it would be back on the farm where I planted, in 1947, I planted 2,000 pine trees behind the house, behind the barn. And I guess um, my favorite place is just walking through there now and just seeing little stubs that I stuck in the ground, beautiful pines that are just straight as a whip and probably could build a, <coughs> build a very nice log cabin if I wanted to. Favorite people while growing up? Well, I've already mentioned Carl and Everett. Everett was, to me, one of the most gentle, um, admirable persons uh, that I ever knew. He was the most gracious funeral director, and I worked for a number of them during my career when I was licensed. He was the most gracious funeral director that I have ever met or seen operate. I've never seen anyone else. Many people thought he was different, and he was. But his difference was, I never heard him say a mean word about a person. I never heard him swear. I, he was just a guy that uh, inspired me to be as good a person as he was. Um, his, his handling of a funeral from the, from the very embalming of the body in the embalming area was always one of graciousness and concern not only for the people who were mourning but for the person that we were working on to, uh, to prepare for the burial. Great guy. And, and uh, it irks me once in a while when I hear someone criticize him for opening a door he would always open the door. You, you couldn't get out of a car in a funeral line without ever running up there making sure that the family's door was open before they got out of the car. And that sort of thing just unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. Um, who else did I admire? Well, it all fan oh, I want to tell you another story about Carl. <laughs> One day I was in the store and over on the corner by the bank was a bench. And on that bench was Charlie Ruggles. Um, who else was over there? Charlie Ruggles was from the insurance. Anyway, there was three or four of the older men, about Carl's age, really, over there. And um, who was it that came in? I think it was Mr. Nelson from the store across the street came in. Carl was in the front window looking out over to the bank where those guys were sitting. And Mr. Nelson says, Carl, what are you doing? Figuring your income tax for this year? Carl says, what are you talking about? Well, you're counting those old guys sitting on that bench, aren't you? <laughs> Carl, Carl got a little upset. But since he and Mr. Nelson were pretty good friends, he kind of chuckled afterward. He says, no, he says, I just was wondering what they're talking about today. But uh, the other thing, I used to always have to count how many bamboo fishing poles were still in the hoop outside the door on a Monday morning, because we never took them in. We had a big hoop on the side of the building, and in there was all the bamboo fishing poles. We didn't lose very many. Once in a while, there'd be a couple of them gone and no, no dollar left or whatever it was, 50 cents. Adolph Anderson was a guy that uh, I also admired. He was, uh, of course, the uh, president of the bank in Montague, along with <coughs> Joe Akabak, who was at that time, I think, president, about the same time was president in Whitehall. I worked at the Parker Dairy. Remember the Parker Dairy out on Whitbeck Road? Yeah. Um, I worked there, the yep, building is still there, I worked there for two years when milking machines first came out. And uh, if you remember, the first milking machines weren't really efficient, so you had to strip the cow after you used the milking machine, and that was a job that I just did not like. I'd rather milk a cow right from the beginning as to just work it toward the end. And we never had cows on the farm. My mother didn't like the way cows smelled. 
he would not have a cow on the farm. Fortunately, the Mowers, Ed Mowers and his mother, who lived on the northwest corner of uh, Hancock, just across the road from us, he had two Jersey cows, beautiful little Jerseys, and gave great milk, lots of cream. Ed was handicapped um, from an unfortunate accident. His father whipped him with a buggy whip once as a boy when he did something. He went upstairs and went to bed, and when he came down the next morning, he was paralyzed on the left side. And uh, Ed never married, of course, and walked with a very bad limp. But he and his mother were there. So we would get the milk from them, and we had lots of chickens, and so they would get the chickens and eggs from us. It never cost us a nickel, it was just a back and forth. You know, you get, you get the chicken and eggs, and we get the milk and cream. So that's the way it went at those times. Um, outstanding events in Montague? Well, like in Whitehall, the homecoming was always a big event. I mean, it was a big event to close the street down, just like we do now. Uh, Friday movies, um, what else? What about the Franklin House fire? The Franklin House fire was a big fire. And uh, I was down there all by myself uh, when it first started because I was <clears throat> on duty that night. And I don't remember who turned the alarm in, but I knew that it was going to go down. Uh, there was no question in my mind that it was a goner. And if you see one of the pictures that was taken, you'll see me standing all by myself. There's only one fire truck there at the time, standing in the middle of Ferry and Dowling Street, looking at the hotel as it's burning up. That was a, a bad, bad situation. I know we, uh, Henry was a big part of starting the whole pumpkin roll, which of course is coming up again. When did that actually, when did kids actually start rolling pumpkins down that hill? Before I did. <laughs> <laughs> so a long time ago. Yeah, it, that went on a long time because it, it was something that I partook in too before it was uh, permitted. I, I was one of them that, that uh, Louis Buttleman used to chase. Louis Buttleman was our constable. And uh, one time, we, he used to park his vehicle down at Ornberger's, which is where a tea car is now, Ornberger's gas station, Shell station. And he was out checking doors, so we got a couple of cement blocks and lifted the rear wheels just off the ground. <laughs> And then we went up the top of the hill and rolled a bunch of pumpkins down. And he knew we were on the top of the hill, so he got in his car and he put her in gear and boy, <laughs> he didn't go anywhere. So we walked down nonchalantly downtown, gave him a hand and put his car back on the road. <laughs> Kinder was gentler than <laughs> Great story. Louis used to get us in as much trouble as he got us out. We'd be down to Green Haven eating, and he'd say, you know, so and so up there's got a beautiful punk, a batch of pumpkins. Then he'd go up and wait for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Whitehall cop, he had a little old hat and a little old coop and everything, but I, we're trying to think of his name, Raleigh, Raleigh Merrick. Raleigh Merrick. Raleigh was, yeah, and he had a white uniform for summers. Remember when the tourists came? He had a white outfit, white hat. Really, really spiffy in this small town, boy. What kind of a car would you call that little thing? With a Chevrolet. But I mean, it was a two-door little coupe cool. thing. It was a roadster, wasn't it? With a, a rumble, rumble seat. seat. With a rumble right, seat. with a rumble seat. Yeah. <laughs> Where could he put his prisoners? We didn't take prisoners. Oh. <laughs> but, uh, Whitehall didn't have a job, or a jail. Montague did have a jail in the back of the fire station. We used to have a jail. Where was it? It's on the old city hall. Yeah. We didn't, I never saw the one in the Whitehall. It wasn't yeah. as fancy. wasn't as good as ours. Ours was bigger. <laughs> <laughs> you had more taverns over here, but we had bigger jails over there. Rolly forgot to, ta he forgot to take One night he put a guy in there and he forgot to go through him. And that door, I think, is eight inches back there in the jail. 
And when he got there in the morning, that guy down there carved through that door oh. to get at the latch. Oh. He used to take us in there all the time and show us that garbage. Well, when two or more are gathered in his name, it's going to have an interesting, uh, uh, an interesting time to listen and learn about a lot of things here in the White Lake area. Uh, I know, uh, gee, I could know you all by name, and uh, so I'd have to introduce myself. Betty Carlson called me, and how can you say no to Betty Carlson and asking me to introduce our speaker, uh, Henry Rossler. Uh, you can, uh, I have a, uh, a habit in the morning, make, make the coffee, and sit down and turn on Good Morning America. And so lately they've been plugging this, this new book, uh, or this movie with Julia Roberts, Eat, Pray, Love, okay? So uh, I, I haven't read it, but I guess what they, they talk about is how this uh, woman goes halfway around the world to find herself. And, um, you know, to find purpose in her life. And our speaker, Henry Rossler, has found purpose in his life right here in, in the White Lake area. And uh, he's going to talk to us this morning about uh, the importance of preservation and education in the White Lake area. Uh, a founding father of the Montague Museum, which is a certainly a uh, wonderful place to spend an afternoon. In fact, last time I was there I had a kidney stone and I remember <laughs> lying on the ground uh, having a kidney stone attack right there as a matter of fact. Don't blame it on the museum. <laughs> That's not, uh, I love the museum. But, <laughs> but the proof in the pudding is uh, Henry and Velma's uh, wonderful family and all the wonderful things that Henry's done here in the in the area. Uh, uh, he lives a life of service above, above self and family above self and and so I'm so pleased that we can have a moment to uh, spend time uh, listening to Henry and all he has to share with us this morning. So friends, welcome Henry Rossler. Henry. Thank you. Well, you know, <coughs> it's uh, been a life goal of mine to save everything. I'm a pack rat. And uh, I was, <laughs> and uh, as a, a young person in the group that got together back in 1964, which was uh, the Lipkas, uh, Pete Lipka and, and Marv and Chuck and Mrs. Wolf uh, and myself and my wife. We were sitting down having coffee together one time and we got talking and Pete was also and so was Mar uh, Marv <coughs> of stuff from farms. At that time a lot of farms were closing down and they would have an auction. Pete was probably the most uh, proficient at talking somebody into giving something that was uh, historically related to the area to the town to the Mont to Montague and most of it ended up in our barn out on Hancock Road and after a couple of years uh, my folks told me that I had to get it out of there it was the barn was full and nothing would belong to us and so <clears throat> we sat down and said well let, let's let's actually form a museum Let's get together, we'll write a constitution, and we'll be the founders, we'll uh, collect things that have a significant meaning to the history of Montague and the White Lake area. You have to recognize that uh, the Lipkas were very, very protective of Montague, and they wanted the things that we were collecting to relate to the Montague side. Uh, there was a little more animosity between the two towns back uh, 40 some odd years, 50 years ago. And although we came over uh, often to the Whitehall side, we, I shouldn't say we didn't get as much welcome, but there just wasn't that much going on in the uh, outskirts of Whitehall because there wasn't that much farming. Most of it was to the north of Montague. And so we began collecting stuff. And then, <clears throat> of course, being lumbering was so important to this area, we began to focus in on lumbering also. And as a kid, I used to go along the lake and you could pick up log ends one after the other. There were probably thousands of them laying in the lake rotting away. 
and uh, as I said, a lot of those ended up in our barn, and uh, so <clears throat> those were collected. And then as you'd walk along the lake, you'd find an iron dog or a wooden dog, um, and then somebody would come along and say, gee, you know, my dad worked in the lumber yard uh, and, or in the lumbering camp, and here's uh, the peavy that he used, or here's the pike pole that my uncle had when he was on the river. And we began gathering all that stuff, and then so in 64 we moved into a little storefront down where the weather vane is now. There was an old hotel built there, which was the Masonic Temple. And uh, we scoured Montague and we went to every merchant and said, have you got a showcase that you're not using? You've got something in the basement that we can use? And we gathered showcase after showcase. And we would get a group of volunteers to help us move all this stuff. Well, we moved into this little store. And within two years, we didn't have any room. We couldn't hardly move in there anymore. So we asked the Masons if we could have the store next to it, which used to be a jewelry store, and he had left. And they said, yeah, go ahead. And uh, I think we gave them $10 a year rent, if I remember, because we didn't have any money. And uh, <clears throat> so from that point on, we really began to focus ourselves on everything that we could gather that had some meaning to the, to the uh, community. If you go over to Montague Museum, you'll find there's, it's in now in the, <clears throat> the old Methodist church on the corner of church and um, and uh, Mead, <laughs> couldn't think of it. And uh, we're running out of room there. Uh, we've got things stored away that we just can't show. So what we've done is we've tried to narrow our collections into groups that relate. For instance, we have everything that related to the ladies and cooking in a kitchen from an old wooden ice box to the first refrigerator with the coils on top, toasters of every style, the old sad irons that you had a uh, handle that you could take and release from the one you were using and pick the one that was on the stove up that was hot and move it back and forth. If, if you ladies uh, who iron today want to stop down there and pick one of those up, you'll understand why you didn't sash your mother because she had muscle, boy, I'll tell you, moving those sad irons around. They are all shapes. There were those that did ruffles because uh, some of the girls had fancy ruffles on their dresses and that. And so there would be a ruffle iron. It's a little different than a flat iron. And uh, then they, um, there's a wooden roller that was used also as an iron. They would heat the wooden roller and use that on a large sheet. In other words, not doing just a little bit with a sad iron, but they would have a, a wooden roller about that big and heat that and roll it that on the sheet, which did it much faster. We have uh, cream separators, um, churns, whatever would have something to do with the kitchen you'll find in there. When uh, Doc Taylor left, he had a bunch of old dentist equipment, including a foot-operated driller. You know, he had to pump the, the, the drill, which ran the drill, and that's what he used in your mouth. We have that office reset. When Dr. Wilk and Dr. Gultz left, we got some of their things, and so we have a doctor's office set up, and you'll see that it wasn't a very comfortable place to sit or lay, and uh, the chests for all of the instruments and medicines, drawer after drawer after drawer and folding doors. What else do we collect? Anything really. If you go downstairs you'll find collections from probably every farm uh, task or chore that you might have had. We have lunch pails that were carried by some of the lumberjacks but most of the people that worked in town and then we decided we have to begin to to, to compile this stuff and so we sat down and tried to <coughs> to uh, get in order when when the stuff we have started and what was behind that and so if you think about it it was uh, in 1642 
when the Potawatomi Indians were slaughtered by the neuter Indians who came down from Canada. They chased them off of the co where the Cockrell Farm is now, chased them to Indian Point, cornered them on the lake, and slaughtered them. The whole history of that is on a record at the Smithsonian Institute, and we have that history there. The Potawatomi camp was a large camp and was a walled camp. It had a stream running through it. The only way that the neuters were able to get the Potawatomi out of there is they dammed the stream, cut off their water supply. And so they had to leave. They couldn't stay there, and so they tried to run out one night, but they didn't make it. It was after that, then, that the Potawatomis never moved back into this area, and the Ottawa Indian, the Ottawa tribes, uh, came in because the neuters came and gone. They were a warring group of people. If you look back, you'll notice that in 1675, Father Marquette stopped on the shores of Lake Michigan at White Lake. He did not come into White Lake with the canoe. Some of his aides came in, and then they found out that the Indians were calling it the White White Lake or White River, which meant it had a clay bottom, and as the water ran through washing what we call marl, you'll know marl is white, would wash out primarily where the old channel is. And so when it went out into Lake Michigan, the water was white with the chalk from the marl. Hmm. And so that's the first time that it was recorded by the French to be the River Blanc, or the White River. And uh, so when you look at the names that the Indians gave it, every one of them referred to white somewhere in the Indian name. Joe Sargent, Job Sargent, came to uh, Michigan in 1817 after the War of 1812 where he was uh, rewarded for his heroism by a grant, a federal grant of land. And uh, on the corner where the weather vane is now is where his son built the first house and blacksmith shop in town. Job's house was up where the Sikinga farm is, just to the north of town. Um, in fact, when they, <clears throat> when they built the NBC school, they uncovered a grave of a, probably a female and a baby. We were quite sure after uh, examining those remains that it was not an Indian burial but probably uh, a member of the sergeant family and a, and a child. I talked to uh, members of the sergeant family and they had no no knowledge or, or history of that ever happening but since it was so close to where the first house was I suspect that there may have been some connection there. It's that sort of thing that we've tried to do as, as a museum. I'm the only one left out of the founders, and we rely primarily and exclusively on volunteers. Nobody gets paid anything, never have. We have never asked uh, for uh, uh, funds unless we were in a major uh, project such as covering all of the stained glass windows in the church with plastic. We, I wrote a, a grant for that, uh, and the city also helps. When we bought the building, it was our decision to buy it in the name of the city for two purposes. One, that would give us the protection of their insurance. And second, we knew that it would be there. If it was, a, if it was just us and something happened to us as founders and whoever followed us decided we want to get out of this thing and sell everything and be gone, uh, that would happen. Now with the city owning the building, and approving of the board of directors and we have generally we have four from the city of Montague, one or two from the Montague Township and one or two from White River Township and we're the ones who try to uh, navigate through the fiscal problems that you have when you have strictly a volunteer group but we've been very fortunate and in fact in uh, 1973 uh, the uh, State Museum Board uh, designate Montague as the outstanding local historical museum. And we thought that was pretty neat because 
none of us are really museum people. We, we didn't know what we were doing except collecting stuff. You'll find in the display uh, room in there most, uh, not most, but a great deal of the logging uh, paraphernalia that we've collected over the years. We have a large display at uh, at the museum. There's no pike pole in there because a pike pole is about 10 to 12 foot long and has a sharp hook on the end. And, it, and we have them mounted in the museum and it was a little more work than we wanted to do to take one down and, and haul in here. It would have been a little hard to display too because of its size. But you'll see log marks in there. We identified most of the <coughs> log marks on, on uh, White Lake. Some of them were registered, some of them were not registered. And you'll see on the wall, along with the displays, those that were registered and many of the Montague and White Lake Whitehall mills were. Uh, there were 16 mills operating on, uh, on uh, White Lake. Um, let me see, I was trying to think what one, in 1882, the total log crop on White Lake was 140 million feet, 140 million feet of lumber cut in one year in 1882. The, uh, the Heald Mill had four four million feet of logs floated down White River in 1860 from Dead Man's Rollaway. And they were using one circular, an upright, and a gang of 40, the largest on the lake, and was only, at that time, the only gang mill on the lake. It also had two gang edgers and one trimmer. The, the circular saws were the, the first ones that were used, and then they came in with the band saws, which would cut much faster and more, more neatly or cleanly. They didn't have as big a kerf as, as the uh, circular saw, so you didn't lose quite as much lumber. It's interesting, when we put a water main down in Montague, downtown, and they got down about three feet, they ran into solid sawdust another three feet, right at the corner of, of Water and Ferry Street. We have some of that sawdust uh, at the museum because it was in a clump. The interesting thing is, while they were down there digging for this, uh, this water main, they got into the sawdust, and the sawdust creates methane. And they didn't know the methane was in there. And they were working down there, and one of the fellows, if I remember, Tom, I don't know where you were around then, lit a cigarette or something, and all of a sudden it just went woof, just a blue flame right across the whole length of the, the ditch. Just fat. Nobody got hurt, but it was just, just a woof. And uh, so we know there's methane below. And when I was police chief, I used to direct traffic on that corner before the expressway went by. If a heavy semi went by, I could feel the road move because that sawdust is like a cushion under there. It's solid. I mean, you can dig it out in clumps, but the road would just, I could just feel it moving under my feet a little bit. So downtown Montague is really built on sawdust. The hill t up to my house and along there, anything that went up the hill, the roads that went up the hill were built with the slabs that were left over from the mill. They'd pile them like uh, a corduroy road. When we tried to put a well or a uh, sewer line in on, was it Wilcox, Tom? Where they ran into all of those edgings? I mean, edgings that were three, four feet deep is where they just piled them up because they didn't have any use for edgings. So. Well, I've got two minutes to go. I don't know what else to say except that we welcome anybody who's got any kind of interest in the history of our area to join us. It costs you ten bucks a year. You'll get the, uh, two meetings, two meetings a year of the board. Uh, uh, this one, uh, this month, will be a picnic out at the park. You'll have some hot dogs and hamburgers and uh, whatever. So you're you're welcome to join us at that time. I don't have my book with me. Twenty. 
well, it, it will, it'll be in the paper, you'll see it. Um, and we would only ask of our uh, volunteers usually one or two days a year to act as a docent at the museum. And if you're brand new, we'll put you with a veteran and help you understand what's there. Um, and the other thing that I, I should mention, though, is that we have a tremendous file cabinet full of family histories. So if you're interested in a family that was here uh, at some time, your own or, or a friend or something, we may have something in, in our files that will tell you more than you may have known about your family. Um, Roger has been in, and Harold have been uh, on our uh, committee, on our uh, museum group for years. Harold does, uh, compiles picture after picture and, and puts them together. He has compiled how many notebooks, Harold? 15, 20? Uh, compiling them all into one so that when you get into it and you look at it, you can follow it from beginning to end. We have a good one on the camera. Pardon? There's a good one in there on the tannery. Yeah, and the tannery, we have everything about the tannery that you might want to know. The other interesting thing is I always remind people that as you work in a museum, you begin to learn things that you didn't realize about your community. One is, you know, after the lumber, when, when everything was cut down and there was nothing here, why did people stay in this area? Because they had the tannery and the Montague Iron Works. Those two were the two industries that kept these two towns alive, or I suspect they wouldn't have been here. Because it's the only place to go to work, unless you owned a shop or something. But if you owned a shop and nobody was working, you wouldn't sell anything. So the tannery and the Montague Iron Works, where they made marine engines, uh, were the saviors of the two towns after the uh, lumbering era. Well. That was great, but then all of a sudden we became the resort area, and all the resorts blew up. Inside I've left, and you can pick them up, I've left a uh, little fact sheet about how we were formed, who was on it, and so forth. And on the back I copied from the Montague Chamber of Commerce at that time a 1940 map, and it'll show you all of the resorts. And there are more resorts on the lake in 1940 than there were lumber mills in the 1800s. So tourism became as big a thing for this area as did the lumbering. But it's kind of interesting to look at this and, and at uh, the Montague Chamber at that time, of course, was not a combined chamber, it was a separate, but they included the Whitehall side, so there wasn't that much <laughs> animosity. <laughs> the other thing that we always look for are booklets that were published either by a church, a woman's group, chamber of commerce, uh, written by someone. There's one on Charles Mears, pioneer of the White Lake area, which uh, I don't think there are very many of these uh, books left anymore. This one was given to me by Frank Zump. The ladies' aid from the congregational church put out a lovely book, uh, very, very informative. <clears throat> so you just got to be on the alert and when you go to a yard sale or something and you see something laying there that nobody else thinks is worth anything, you look and you say, oh, a souvenir program and scheduled events for Whitehall's great homecoming, July 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 1914. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of interesting to look in here because uh, as some of you know, I worked for the G's for a long time, and Lynn G is, is uh, pictured in here, uh, Carl G, uh, and it's kind of interesting to look at these sorts of things. I would ask any of you, if you run across anything like that and you don't want it and you don't know what to do with it, please call me. <laughs> don't throw it away. Let me see it anyway. No matter if you think, oh, that looks ratty, they wouldn't want that. Yes, we would, because maybe the one you got has got two pages missing, but the one we got has got those two pages, but got three other ones missing. And so we can then get a complete set. So that's what we are. We're, we're hopeful, been wa working with the uh, Whitehall uh, Historical uh, Group, 
and uh, trying to work with them so that whatever sorts of things they're gathering, which they don't have a, a uh, central file or a central place to keep it, they have it, as I understand, Secretary has it a little bit here and the Treasurer has a little bit here, is to say, look, if, if you want this in one place that you can have access to it, we have another filing cabinet at the museum. It'll be your filing cabinet, but it'll be there. And when you need it or if you want it, it'll be available to you as well as to other people who come in trying to do some research on family or um, a situation, uh, an event, the uh, Colville Railroad wreck or whatever it might be. So when you go in, also I left some applications to become a member. They're in there by the displays. If you'd like to, take one. If you, even if you don't, you just want to know something about the museum, pick one up. But if you are interested in joining, we'd be more than pleased to have you. Any questions or responses? Yes? You didn't say anything about, I thought there was a brick factory out there. Well, the brick factory was here in Whitehall. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, that was the Ruggles. Uh, I didn't know which side of the river it was. No, it was on this side. Just. The trail that goes along uh, from Lions Park, well, it's uh, Baldwin Street. Baldwin yeah, Street. The, the bit was on Baldwin Street. Right. So you go to the end of Baldwin Street, and that's where the uh, clay brick, uh, the, the brick uh, works were. You can still find pieces of clay. Yeah, there's still <laughs> still chips of it there. So yes. When did the logging stop or, or phase out? Uh, Got the last mill. Let me just see. It was uh, I think it was nineteen three or something. Nineteen yeah. The last river drive was oh three and then the Staples and Cobalt Mill uh, ended in nineteen oh seven. Seven. Okay. I knew it was three something. Well, from how far inland were they getting the lumber? All the way up to the end of White River. And how far was that? Well, it's up to uh, White, Cloud. White Cloud, beyond White Cloud. Cause, and, and they'd go beyond the end of the river because oh, they sure. could haul it to the river. Yeah. But, yeah. Henry? If they go in there, they'll see that there are different log strikes for the same log company. And when that told that log come from this company at White Cloud, this come from the company at New Angle. So they knew how many logs each camp cut every year because they all had a different strike on the end of the log. You didn't talk about people who came in and swiped the logs on the way down the river. Well, they all did. <laughs> they were all rust log rustlers. That's why they branded them, and that's why you found so many ends in the lake, because they cut off the brand and put mine on. Well, they after they stopped that, they started brand branding them on the side. Yeah. So, yes? Talking about the money that we partially built on sawdust, that, that whole area where Brunswick Bowling is in Muskegon, that's all sawdust. Yep. And the whole building shakes when a big <laughs> truck goes down the right Yeah. I mean, it, it's bound to. You know, if you've got three, four feet of sawdust and it's compacted, I mean, it, it's a, what we have at the museum is a chunk. I mean, it's like a brick almost because it's so compacted. But, uh, yeah, it, it'll still move because, you know, it's got some, some yeah. cellular uh, mm -hmm. qualities to it. But. But if you haven't been in the museum, please come. I think you'll you'll see things that uh, you'll say, "Oh my gosh, I remember that."